introduction of the college um, to Joseph sir. So we are the students of Rashna Sansa Academy of Architecture based in Mumbai. We were one of the first colleges of architecture in Mumbai, and today we are a proud institution of around 500 students and a rich alumni body. We have been inviting professionals from uh, architecture and light fields as a part of lecture series called Design Dialogues. And this is an extended version of it in this very particular week called Confluence Week. So we find ourselves very lucky to have you as a part of this dialogue. So now let's move ahead with an introduction to the speaker for everyone. Let's move to the next slide. Yes. So today we have architect Joseph Koma with us for a presentation on computational design. He is a designer, researcher, and educator operating at the intersection of mathematics, folding structure, and materials. His material-based explorations have been noted as spearheading research into the use of foldable components. He is the author of Morphing, a guide to mathematical transformations for architects and designers, and has won several awards, including first place in 2013 Emerging Voices Award. So now let's move ahead with the speaker explaining to, uh, to us himself. So over to you, sir. So thank you for that kind introduction, and uh, I, and it's it's that you know we're in unusual circum circumstances here with uh, COVID nineteen, but um, although that's brought unusual circumstances, it's also brought opportunities like this where we're able to share knowledge, you know, across these, this virtual mode, and really uh, just kind of start to democratize how we just share information and transform how we build as a collective. And I'm happy to be here to just share some thoughts, insights, experiences on my work, my approach to design and research, as well as my approach to teaching and pedagogy. And uh, a few years ago, I, I was in Mumbai for the, the Fab uh, Biennale. And I must say, I, I absolutely love Mumbai and especially the people there. So I wish I could be there, but unfortunately, you know, this is what, how it is. And, uh, and also, I'm really delighted to see Shripad again. Uh, he was, I had interacted with him uh, in the Digital Futures Workshop and uh, built a nice friendship. So I'm happy to reconnect with you again. And so I've titled this talk, Constraints as Opportunities. The way in which a problem is decomposed imposes fundamental constraints on the way in which people attempt to solve that problem. Rodney Brooks. So I've had, if I asked you to make a cube with a sheet of paper, you might cut six squares together and create a cube like this, or you might cr create a cruciform shape and fold that paper to create a cube like this, a cube with discrete sides and discrete edges. But if I gave you a ball of clay and I asked you to make a cube with your hands, you might compress it in multiple directions, yielding a cube like this, a cube with rounded corners. So depending on which tool or medium is utilized, will influence the set of possible results. This also relates to an idea called instrumentation, where essentially a tool or instrument is used to record. However, the way in which a tool or instrument is used to record is the design decision. So for instance, here's a photograph of a helicopter moving. We may think we know what a helicopter moving is or might look like, but it's when recorded here in a long exposure photograph, we get something else. So when I see this photograph by Andreas Feininger, I don't just see the helicopter, I see a wireframe drawing. I see a tube of space. I see both the outside of that space and the inside of that space simultaneously. So through that representational abstraction, we're able to see other possibilities. So again, the way in which something is recorded changes the way in which we understand it and perceive it. Similarly, you know, when you think about someone making a painting, if I was to paint the presence of a person in space, that's instrumentation or recording. And it's also not that uncommon for someone to try to make a painting or a work of art that tries to emulate a famous work of art. So it's kind of a recording of another recording. Um, in the case of Mona Lisa, I'm sure many people have attempted to paint the Mona Lisa through the same means and methods. However, in this case, this artist adds additional rules or constraints. 
So this is a brush pen, one continuous spiraling line. And as the pressure of that brush pen changes, the thickness of that line changes. And so here, by adding new constraints, we actually get new opportunities. And that's really gets to the heart of how I approach teaching and my research. There are two kinds of scientific revolutions, those driven by new concepts and those driven by new tools. In the last 500 years, we have had five major concept-driven revolutions. During the same period, there have been about 20 tool-driven revolutions. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, the difference between something concept-driven or tool-driven is more blurred than distinct. Do we need a good idea to begin or can we just begin? You know, sometimes if we have an idea, we may think of it like as a hypothesis and then we test it through making models and drawings or some other kind of tool-driven approach. Well, if we don't have an idea, sometimes we begin by just literally embracing the material at hand, start making models, start drawing. And hopefully through that process, we generate ideas. So for me, tool-driven and concept-driven are more blurred in my work and the way in which I approach teaching. And I, I definitely don't believe you need a concept in order to just start designing. Concepts can happen at any time. Another thing with this quote, when Freeman Dyson writes about it, he also writes about the astronomer James Bradley, who had numerous contributions, but one of them in particular was in collaboration with George Graham, who was an instrument maker, and together they were the first to calibrate the telescope. And so for me, the idea of calibration is also really important, and you'll see that throughout this process. Early on, a lot of my work was looking at demystifying tools. So a lot of times we use different tools, especially software, but we're not aware of the, the engine that's underneath that software. So I became interested in kind of looking under the hood and diving into, in particular, mathematics. My understanding of mathematics is recorded in this book, Morphing a Guide to Mathematical Transformations for Architects and Designers, where I use design as a means to understand math and really show how math can be used as a design tool. And as part of that, I also uh, re-understand architecture by recreating existing buildings with mathematics. So I use my unique understanding of math to understand architecture through a different lens. Oftentimes now when I, when I work with mathematics, I do what I call sketching with mathematics. So to me, sketching is different than drawing in, in some sense because Usually when we make a drawing in the most formal sense, it's a very particular kind of drawing. Is it a plan? Is it a two point perspective? Is it an axonometric? And each of these types of drawing conventions, we have to follow a very explicit set of rules and frameworks in how to construct them. Well, to me, sketching is a little bit more like the diagram. It's, it's somewhere between a uh, dream and reality. It's about generating ideas. Or as Stan Allen would describe the diagram as that which is in between theory and practice. So here's math. This is uh, looking at a torus or a donut from kind of more of a perspective that's almost like an elevation. And then we have X, Y, Z, U, V. X, Y, Z, Cartesian grid in space, and then U, V are the parameters. And when you look at this equation, it may seem a bit foreign, or maybe to some it might even seem a little bit intimidating, um, but it's, it's pretty simple. And if I start to break it down, so if I look at cosine V and sine V, that's just a circle. If I look at sine u, cosine u, that's just another circle. And if I look at sine u, cosine u, that's a third circle. So really a donut or a torus is just the interpolation of three circles. So once you can understand that, then you can do a lot of exciting things with this. And so for instance, here we can start out by just by adding an integer in the front of that sine function. We can increase the radius of this shape. If I change it to one, then we're, we're decreasing the radius, where now it's kissing at the centroid. Or if we remove that altogether, we're back to a circle, or sorry, a sphere. And then here we can look at the U and V, the extents of that shape. And as I change it, you can see I cut it in different directions. And then here, by adding a U plus V, I'm able to twist the shape, but in this case, we have to also cut it in order to show how it's becoming a twisted boundary. And then here, placing a high frequency wave inside of a low frequency wave. 
uh, essentially is what I would call texturing. And then the same transformation here, so these two are the same transformation, but here's another low frequency inside of a low frequency. So they look drastically different, but it's just based on how it's calibrated. And then here, uh, placing the equations inside of functions of sine starts to flatten the shape. So we're back to the cube where we started this presentation. So now I'm gonna show you an example of how I've designed with this using some of these basic transformations. So here I do texture, here I do twisting, here I do flattening, here I do cutting. Then we could say this is an elevation per pavilion, or you know, we may say we wanna go a little further. So what happens if we have a double twist? So here's a double twist. Now we get into ideas of duality and contested symmetry, where two sides are competing with one another for hierarchy, which is an interesting aesthetic idea. So here's looking at the single twist. Here's looking at the double twist. Here's looking up the single twist. And here's looking up the double twist. Now I could just stop here and say, okay, let's enter this in a competition. Let's build it, use some steel and cladding, call it a day, then move on to the next project. But at some point I started to look at the work from a more critical lens. And I said, just because we can build it with our current means and methods, doesn't mean we should. Yes, we can do that. We live in a world where almost anything is possible to build. That doesn't mean that anything should be built. You know, in particular, about 40% of the carbon in the world is from the built environment. So we have to start changing the way in which we think about design and construction. So maybe those ripples don't want to be ripples. You know, maybe they want to be curved creases. So maybe instead of a process of pure in instrumentation or pure recording, it has to go through a process of translation where it's allowed to change and evolve as we change the medium we're working with. So why folding? Well, as soon as I fold the sheet of paper, we get structural depth. If I organize the folds appropriately, we can have flat packing capabilities and we can have numerous variations possible with one systematic method. So structural properties, flat packing capabilities, numerous variations. Now that said, the work I'm interested in is not origami, but it's folded structures. And what, there's a clear distinction for me for that. So a lot of origami is based on undertucked hidden folds and don't have a specific orientation. But once you fold the geometry with a very specific orientation to gravity, with the intent of carrying loads, with the intent of being built at a larger scale with actual materials, it's no longer just origami. We're critiquing it and evaluating it through a different lens. So it's a fold structure. That said, most folded structures within, which we, which we call in the discourse of architecture, folded structures are not folded at all, but are fold inspired. And what I mean by that is this is considered the world's first folded structure. However, it's really not folded at all. It's, it's really fold inspired. This is a precast concrete structure. It's not folded like the way we literally fold paper by hand. And I'm precisely interested in how we can translate something like that at the architectural scale. So how do we translate paper folding to materials which have the potential to scale up? And the material I look at is fiber reinforced polymer, FRP, also known as fiberglass or carbon fiber. And although fiberglass and carbon fiber have been around for a while, it's only within recent years that the International Building Code has recognized it as a viable building material. It's also only within recent years that the American Composites Manufacturers Association has written the first guidelines and recommended practices for FRP materials. This doesn't mean that it is the material of the future, but these trends suggest that it's be much more commonly used in architecture than it currently is today. So if that's the case, what is the future of FRP for architectural applications? So this is the SF MoMA expansion designed by Snohetta, fabricated by Chrysler Associates. 
It's the largest implementation of FRP materials in the United States and made major advancements in fireproofing technology. However, it's made of 710 panels that were fabricated with 710 unique molds. Each mold was used only once and then discarded. Now to me, this gets into the same notion of, yes, we can do this. We live in a mass customized world, but just because we can do it, maybe it doesn't mean we should, especially when a well-made mold could be used over a thousand times. So is many unique molds the future for FRP materials? I'm not convinced by that. On the other hand, this is David Reby of Windsor Fiberglass. And here he's seeing what is possible with one mold. So he designs one mold where all the edge conditions of that mold are exactly the same, such that when he creates a wall panel and you rotate that wall panel, it gives the optical illusion of variation. I like this. This is rigor through constraints. Whereas the Joseph Alpers would say economy of design, minimum means maximum effect. I think this is a future. And I actually think with this mindset, the SF MoMA expansion maybe could have gotten a similar visual effect with five or six molds instead of 710. And then we get into reconfigurable molds like this one by ADAPA, ADAPTA's mold. This is used a lot in the aircraft industry as well as the automotive industry. It's, it's a great technology, allows for numerous variations, except for the fact it's not a technology that's accessible to everyone. This is an expensive machine. I can't just buy one and put it in my garage. And I'm really interested in how we can democratize how we build by making technology accessible to everyone. And then here we have no mold, some research done in Stuttgart, where robotic arms and drones are used to weave carbon fiber and fiberglass to create structures like this. I think this is a future. And I think it has some great applications. However, it's not the future for everything. For instance, if we need a structure for disaster relief, this is not the ideal structure. You can't flat pack this and deploy it. It takes time to essentially fabricate it. So even though it's, it doesn't require a mold, it's, it's not ideal for all, all situations. Similarly, this approach relies heavily on robotic arms and drones, which are high-tech features. And I wonder within that sea or cloud of high-tech possibilities, are we sometimes missing other low-tech features that are out there? So this is my approach. So that was pretty simple. I take a dry fiber reinforcement fabric, I apply a mask, I paint on resin, I remove the mask, and I have a foldable composite. It's so simple that it seems almost trivial, except for the fact that no one had ever done it before. Why did no one ever do it before? Well, that's because when given fiberglass, the thought is we need a mold. So in order to see beyond that, we have to remember to forget to see new possibilities. Similarly, the technique I showed you there was completely low tech, which means anyone can do it. You can do it. And the, but on the other hand, it's also a technique that could be fully automated. So with some simple inkjet printing technology, we can think of it as a zone A and a zone B, 
which is the, which were essentially one is coated with the resin that cures over time, while the other one is cured when exposed to a specific temperature of UV light. And so it is possible to completely automate this in a high tech way, but it's also possible to use, keep do it in an extremely low tech simple way. And I'm really interested personally in this parallel or duality between high tech and low tech and how we invent in both realms. So I'm gonna show you how I start to scale this up with an arch. Here's a crease pattern that's 32 feet by 22 feet, possibly the largest crease pattern that's ever been made. But the entire crease pattern flat packs to a width of just 12 inches, which meant four individuals could easily carry it to site. And then it's deployed, where here it's spanning 16 feet. It's 12 and a half feet tall by 12 feet wide, and it has just a material thickness of 1 16th of an inch. So it's really thin for that span. And here's a close up. After doing that, then my question was, what are the constraints and limitations of translating paper folding into foldable composites? Is it possible that everything I fold out of paper can be folded with fiberglass? So I try to answer that question with another question. Is it possible to fold fiberglass along curved creases? So I look at a saddle geometry. So here's a saddle made in the Bauhaus by a student of Joseph Albers in 1927, a series of concentric circles. So here's what that crease pattern look, looks like, alternating between mountain and valley folds. And when folded and oriented towards gravity, it looks like this. But then when you increase the number from eight to 20, you get a different range of freedom. So you can see here where, this, where my hand is, is not a trivial part of this photograph. I'm distorting it and I'm able to distort it because it has a certain level of flexibility. And I started wondering, I wonder with fiberglass and resin, is it possible to freeze it at any position? Maybe I can freeze it like this, just like the way my hand is positioning it. So we fold it. So to fold that fiberglass uh, disc, and that was the first time we'd ever folded it, took three minutes. We did not practice. That was the first time we'd done anything like that. Well, to fold the piece of paper with 20 concentric circles, uh, it took almost two hours for me to fold. Why did the paper take almost two hours, but the fiberglass disc took just three minutes? Well, it's because the material itself actually started to become programmed. There were zones that were meant to be rigid and there were zones that were meant to be flexible. It inherently wanted to be folded. And from there, and you can see also on the image on the left, a lot of times when you think about scaling up folding, uh, it, oftentimes it's overlooked that we also have to scale up the hinge itself. So calibrating the width of those, those hinges it's nothing that is very important and not trivial at all. So here's some images of it. And when I look at it here, from this view in particular, and I go back to my earlier sketch of mathematics of the torus, you know, this has ideas of duality or contested symmetry. It has singularities for our eye to trace in 3D space, similar to those ripples. So maybe that torus didn't want to be a torus at all. Maybe it just wanted to be 20 concentric circles. So that said, what are the potential architectural applications? Now you may look at that artifact and think it's more like a sculpture. So how does this relate to more typical buildings? And for that, I start to look at ceiling or wall. 
here's a crease pattern that was inspired by the work of David Huffman. And when I look at this crease pattern, I don't just see a crease pattern, but I see a reflective ceiling plan. So all those diamonds in space seem like locations for columns in space. <clears throat> so how do I take this and translate this into maybe a ceiling? Here it's folded out of paper. And here it's folded out of one continuous sheet of fiberglass. This is just one sheet of fiberglass. And this is at a scale, to give you a sense of scale, this is eight feet long. And so it's at the scale of a wall partition. And ideally this would be at the scale of a full, sl of a full slab, but for this particular proof of concept, it also was at, worked at the scale of just simply a wall partition. Now as a slab, if you imagine it as a stay in place formwork for concrete for your, for your ceiling above you, then the fiberglass is literally the tensile, has the tensile reinforcement where you need it most in the slab on the underside. So it potentially becomes a way to reduce the amount of concrete we use in a typical slab. And here you can see it standing up with a structural depth of one foot. Here's a detail of one of those notes. And then I look at column. So here's a column folded out of paper. Here's a column folded out of fiberglass that's eight feet tall. And although I start out by critiquing the notion of a mold, wouldn't this be a great stay in place formwork for again, a concrete column or a reusable formwork for a concrete column where we reuse the same formwork over and over again? So that started to get me to think about concrete. In particular, how can folding advance concrete casting? 80% of the buildings in the world are concrete, and if 40% of the carbon in the, in the world is from the built environment, maybe we can somehow make that process a little bit more sustainable. And this is how concrete casting is typically done for precast concrete. There's these extremely heavy duty formworks that are difficult to move, and they produce the same part over and over again. And then when they do custom formworks like this, uh, these are very expensive to produce. Each one is completely custom and they're used only once and then discarded. So lots of material waste and lots of cost. A very large portion of this construction budget was actually dedicated to formworks that weren't in the end part of the building. They were just used to make the building. So I've been collaborating with DTH and Zurich, two research groups there. Um, and the three, the, essentially, we can think of us as a team of three, as far as groups are concerned. There's the expert with, with an expertise in the chemistry of concrete. There are the experts who are experts in what we call digital concrete or set on demand casting, which, which, uh, and also in robotic fabrication. And then my expertise in this case was in uh, crease engineering and geometry. So as one of the principal inv investigators, my role was in the design and engineering of the formworks through curve crease folding. And our goal was how thin can we make a formwork and make it more sustainable? And the first problem they, they gave me was how could we make a simple hinge stronger for casting? So this is a simple hinge. It's what we call a non-stable structure. So if you were to pour this, this thing would just deform. It's never fixed at a particular angle. But when I introduce curved creases that kiss on both sides, at some point as I fold this paper, it pops inward. You could think of this as controlled buckling. Buckling is normally thought of as a bad thing, but if it's buckling inward as the concrete is pushing outward, that buckling will be able to resist the hydrostatic pressure of the concrete. So it actually makes for a very strong formwork. And so here's an image of a formwork. And this is what one looks like. That's just paper. That's paper that's just a half a millimeter in thickness and one side of it is wax coated. And this is one meter tall. And then here it's being poured and you can see there where it's resisting the hydrostatic pressure of the concrete, no deformation. And the real beauty of it is it peels off like a candy wrapper and re reveals a super smooth surface finish. So you can actually keep the paper on ship it to sites and then peel it off. Uh, so this way you're always keeping intact that perfect surface finish. 
And here's a detail of it there. Presently, we're casting some columns that are three meters tall that also taper using the same method. And we've been very successful, but we're still in the final calibration process of both the formwork geometry as well as the, the chemistry behind the concrete and set on demand casting process. So I have no doubt that folding can transform the way we design and build. However, I think it's just one future of many possible exciting futures out there. Throughout this research, this quote came to mind quite often. Technology is the answer, but what was the question? And this is a quote by Cedric Price that has been, I think, used a lot in architecture. And when I keep thinking about this, technology is the answer. What's the question? What's the question? What's the question? And then I start saying, well, I don't know, actually, maybe, maybe the first question is, what is technology? Maybe that's the question back to Cedric Price. I often see these articles that say the future of building is, and then they say something, additive manufacturing, robotic fabrication, or something else, some other high-tech thing, AI. But we're not very critical about how we define technology. Just to build something with a robot doesn't mean you're inventing something or making a clear contribution to something. So just to take technology and stir it in there doesn't, isn't really innovation. And in particular, when I go to the word, the root of the word technology, which is techne, which is a Greek word, it actually means technique, craft, and calibration. It doesn't mean high tech, like the way we think about technology. Technique, craft, and calibration. And so to me, yeah, maybe techne is a possible future. But I think today, more than ever, we have to be very critical about how we define technology. And then that also made me think about intelligence. And, you know, when I look at the work I was doing with fiberglass, you know, it's so simple that it almost seems trivial and dumb. You know, even when you look at the crease pattern by Joseph Alberts, a series of concentric circles, it seems really dumb. But when you fold it, you get this amazing saddle geometry. And so, and I started really wondering, and especially with AI becoming more and more of a, uh, a hot topic within architecture today, I started thinking we have to be much more critical about how we define intelligence. And sometimes things that seem seemingly dumb are actually brilliantly smart. And it's precisely that dumbness that makes it rigorous and smart. And so that's led to my most recent book, The Philosophy of Dumbness. And in particular, I start out by looking at a, creating a recipe for dumbness based on looking at examples in science, art, and architecture. And the first one is start simple. So you can think about Fry Otto's soap bubbles. And he says, the secret, I think, of the future is not doing too much. All architects have the tendency to do too much. And then we have be irrational. So the idea of connecting a beam on the side of a column, like in the Farnsworth house, that seems like a dumb idea, but it's precisely that detail that allows us to objectify the column in autonomy, to appreciate the column in itself, almost like a piece of art. Or as Paul Clay would say, art does not reproduce what we see, rather it makes us see. And I believe architecture can do that as well. And sometimes we have to be irrational in order to do that. And then lastly, don't forget to forget. You know, like I said with my work with fiberglass, I never would have saw folding fiberglass as a possibility if I was blinded and stayed blinded by the mentality that in order to do fiberglass, we need a mold. To see is to forget the name of the thing one sees. Paul Valerie. When the project began as a manifesto of my own ideas, really a meta reflection of the work I've done. And then I decided that no, it shouldn't be a manifesto, it should be an anti-manifesto. And I thought about a moment in history when two architects designed glass houses, a, a, an artist painted white on white canvas, and a music composer composed a piece of four minutes and 33 seconds of silence or didn't play a note just as a means to objectify the sounds of an atmosphere. Two glass boxes, white and white canvas, objectifying the sounds of an atmosphere, all happening within a five-year period in history. 
that's not a singular manifesto. That's being part of a collective in, at a particular moment in time. And I think there's actually a lot of individuals currently who are interested in how we define rigor and intelligence. So that said, I asked over 50 architects, engineers, designers, and landscape architects, what is the dumbest but smartest thing you've done? And the range of responses was truly extraordinary. So here you're looking at a series of spreads from the book, and it's, it's recorded in almost a very scientific manner, where on the left side is an image, and on the right side is their small contribution. And again, for me, the beauty of the book is that it's not a zygous mentality of there is one future but there's many exciting possible futures. And another part of this that I think is really exciting is when I look at this work, is it also became an opportunity to bring people together who wouldn't normally be brought together. So for instance, in the top left, there's Patrick Schumacher, and then adjacent to Patrick Schumacher is Mark Foster Gage. And even to the next one over is Jill Zretzen. These three individuals in the top, they might be published in a publication together. That's not that uncommon. But on the other hand, and then in this next page here, you can see in the middle row, we have Marlon Blackwell, Sean Godsell, and then Brian McKay Lyons. These three individuals might be in a publication together as well. But when do you find, you know, Brian McKay Lyons in the same publication as Mark Gage? And that's where it's really interesting to me is how a seemingly dumb question has brought all of these individuals together through a lens where each of them can respect each other's craft, discipline, and what they bring to architecture. And this I would call like a directed conversation or how we design a conversation about the future of architecture. And in many ways, I think that manifesto or anti-manifesto is like this phase that has been broken and put back together precisely. You know, again, it's both the manifesto and anti-manifesto simultaneously. The manifesto is, is that there's not just one manifesto, but there's many exciting futures. As long as we can provide a lens to look at one another and appreciate one another. This relates to also how I approach pedagogy. And in particular, for they have learned and not merely been taught. When I first started teaching, I taught too much. I taught too much meaning to teach to me suggests to emulate. And it was really um, a, pro a learning experience for me to learn how to teach. And the way in which I did it was I started to design pedagogical exercises or frameworks or games for students to play. And as they, they went through them, they learned an idea or concept. So how did I design frameworks rather than literally try to have the students emulate what I would do? And that's recorded in my book, Etude for Architects, which documents my approach to pedagogy for early design students. And oftentimes I tell my students, if you don't know what to do, do something. There's nothing more frustrating than seeing a student sitting at their desk, scratching their head saying, I don't know what to do. I'm trying to come up with an idea. I don't believe you need a genius idea to start. If you don't know what to do, do something. The act of sketching, making a physical model, or even writing an algorithm can help generate ideas. And as a result, most of the way in which I approach pedagogy is through a tool-driven approach to make students feel com confident that they can start designing with anything in front of them. And so here, this is in, in a Foundations One studio, where on the left, there's hand-drafted drawing of a Boolean operation or shapes carving shapes, and the right is a physical model looking at that interior void. Or here on the left, looking at shapes that intersect. And then on the right, looking at a model that explores heterogeneous space or spaces that are overlapping one another. And then here, a model that looks at folding and curved creases where a column rotates around like a bicycle wheel. Or here, hand drafting again, curves with straight lines or ruled surfaces. And then on the right, making a model with sticks. And I emphasize that they're done by hand because I don't believe computation is just the instrumentation of the computer, but it's just a means of thinking 
to rules, parameters, and constraints. So these are just generated with rule-based logic, but they're not relying on software. And then later, in later studios, like in Architectural Foundations too, we use similar ideas where on the top left is the student's simple Part T diagram for a building. There's a series of volumes that are stacked on top of each other. And then through this process, they're able to define the outer boundary of, that, of their building. Uh, not completely different than the Seattle Public Library by OMA. And then again, working back and forth between digital and analog. So you can see these X-ray wireframes, which I, I like because of their abstraction, but then how they relate to also the physical model below. Or here's an example of a student designing a museum in Charlotte, North Carolina, where there's a series, or there's really two intersecting rings with one another. So all this said, what is design? I once heard a faculty say that design is this mysterious mythical thing. I don't think so. I think it can be defined very simply. I believe design is both a noun and a verb. And in most cases, both simultaneously. So as a verb, it's an iterative, reflective and rigorous process. But along that process at any time, we can stop, pause and reflect on, on that design as a noun, as a thing so that we can critique and evaluate. But after we evaluate it, we continue to move forward in the process. And even when a building is built and an architect walks through that building, they are still reflecting on that building. They're still learning from that building as a means, and they're remembering the past, but they're also using it as a means to identify opportunities for the future. So in many ways, by saying you're gonna become a designer and architect, you're also saying you're gonna become a life learner. And this also relates to, I think, research. You know, Randolph Glanville once said that scientific methods are actually a subset of, research, of, of design research. And when I look at the word research, I think research is just fundamentally research, iteratively searching. And I think we do this a lot in design and architecture. We're constantly iteratively searching for new ideas and opportunities. So to me, design and research are inherently intertwined or interrelated. You really don't do one without the other. We design experiments and experiences, and we're constantly researching for new ideas in the design process. So I do a course, uh, hope sometimes once a year, uh, which, I, which is kind of in this lens of research through teaching, teaching through research, where instead of the students uh, learning from me in a more hierarchical setting, we just simply collaborate on a research project. And when we collaborate on a research project, the students learn how I would approach an applied research project, but they're also able to contribute at any point in time. And so one of these is, is at the undergraduate level uh, called tailoring architecture. And the simple goal was to advance fabric formwork for concrete by looking at tailoring techniques used in fashion. So here's just a series of tiles. And then here are three columns that are done. And again, there's, a, there's an economy in this and there's a practicality to it because we're working with very thin formworks. But then there's also this beautiful kind of aesthetic possibilities. You know, what would a space look like instead of a, a typical office building where we have just a concrete slab and concrete columns that are very normative, what would a space look like if that was tailored like a pair of pants or a pair of octopus pants? And so those are the kind of possibilities we started looking at. What are some of the effects as well as the efficiencies of this method. Now on the other spectrum, you know, also I, I, I advise them in our P, on our PhD committees. So Mustafa Alani was looking at Islamic geometric patterns, but instead of looking at them through a lens of history or geography, he decided to look at it in a nonlinear way through computation and morphology to draw new correlations that we have not seen before for Islamic geometric patterns. And then this brings me to the idea of culture. Um, I previously taught a course called Natural Composite Structures. But for that class, I decided to collaborate with a dear friend, Wissam al Sali, who's a Syrian architect. And this is one of his buildings in Jordan, which is a school he designed. And when he designed the school, he decided to, instead of using the construction budget to ship materials onto the site, 
he decided to literally use the dirt on the site as the construction material. And all he had to do was add 2% cement to that mixture in order to make it work. But by doing that, he was able to put all the money of the construction budget into artisan labor. And so the craftsmanship is really extraordinary. So here we're looking at a plan that's a square, but is tapering to a dome with an oculus for a classroom. And I became really interested in the way in which he works as a certain efficiency with using materials at hand nearby. And again, how constraints yield opportunities. And so we were going to propose to uh, have a class where this, my students and his, and his students with mine uh, design a tensile structure or some kind of structure uh, for a pavilion for a school in Jordan. But instead of the mindset of, okay, we're just going to do this and we're going to bring it there, it became about how do we have a dialogue? What can we learn from Jordan and what can Jordan learn from us? How do we exchange ideas? How do we learn from each other? How do we learn to listen? Oftentimes architects are learned to talk, but we're not, we're not taught how to listen. So how do we talk less and listen more? And then through this lens, the future of building is not derivative of or subservient to the advancement of technology, but is embedded within a larger knowledge base rooted in cultures of making. Not only do the students learn to engage in material-based design and research, but they learn to respect and appreciate site as culture. And I think this is really important. And here's just one of the many artifacts that were produced in that course. So here's a column where the traditional craft of caning is used and the natural material of rattan is used. And I like to think of this as making that matters. We're not just making things and we're not just learning by doing, but it somehow has a positive impact in the world, both practically as far as how we think about reducing the carbon footprint of how we build, but also culturally and socially and how we start to still embrace cultures of placemaking. So that said, let's embrace constraints as design opportunities. The world is rapidly changing. Let's lead the way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. The presentation was very, very interesting. We kind of got to listen to things we never thought we could. It was very new and interesting to us. Uh, now we are open to questions from the audience side. If anyone wants to type in questions, they could do that, or they could also unmute themselves to ask any questions if you have. Uh, hello, I wanted to ask a question. So uh, you said uh, when uh, you made the fiberglass, um, the, uh, the concentric circles, there were some calculations uh, involved, uh, involved and the precise uh, th thicknesses of the circles had to be maintained. So uh, is that where the computation part comes in? And uh, how do you exactly go about doing this thing? Do you, uh, do you use some uh, programming or what is the process basically? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, there's a lot of other computational methods that are uh, embedded within some of this research that I didn't show. Um, and because uh, if I get into that, it can become like a whole lecture in itself too. Um, but some of my research with computation is looking at how I go from continuous smooth surfaces as an input and translate that into folded geometries. So how do I re-record something that's an input? Maybe I want a particular saddle shape that I modeled in Rhino or some other software, but how would I now make that into a folded geometry where I'm using the folds to create structure, but also kind of using that initial curved surface as a centerline geometry? Um, for the part you're talking about, um, and then maybe I'll say there's one other, another part of it that I'm using with computation where uh, when I'm doing work with, in particular with the controlled buckling, understanding those curves and, uh, and understanding them precisely about how a particular curve changes as its proportion changes, the angle, which, if, which the, the extent in which it can flex changes. So calibrating that is really important to understand when you're getting the maximum amount of controlled buckling without over buckling. So there is some computation in there to really get those geometries just right. It's very simple, but 
it's a very, very precise calibration. The part you're talking about with the width of the hinges, um, those, that's not done through computation per se. That's really done through more material-based uh, physical experiments. And it, because as the material thickness changes, that width changes. And also as the extent of, or even the radius of the arc changes, that, that width has to change. But that's really more of a back and forth trial and error process of kind of creating my own uh, database of calibrations for how I have to vary that width subtly in order to get the right arc. And if it, to give you an idea, if, if, I, if I don't get the right arc, I might get a cusp like this, and then that becomes the point of failure for that folded geometry. It'll get a crack along there. And if I do it too wide where I get too big of an arc, then I get too much degrees of freedom where this thing starts to deform. So that's kind of a, yeah, so there's, that's, but that's again, not so much computational, it's more just uh, experimental physical you know, testing. Thank you, sir. Yeah, can I ask a question? Yes, sir, sure. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, my video is off. Uh, yeah, wonderful lecture, uh, sir. Really, very, very inspiring. I just had a question, which was, I uh, you know you uh, showed us some work where uh, we generally associate technology to, to, uh, to machines and actually to associate crafts with technology uh, and computational kind of uh, analysis. Have you ever tried to examine a particular craft in your, uh, in your uh, new perspective and kind of check where it leads? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's something I'm starting to do more. Um, I think, uh, you know, you saw a little bit of that in that last presentation where with the caning and, you know, we're and combining kind of caning with ruled surfaces to get this kind of hourglass shape. So there's a combination of the craft being radicalized uh, through caning. There was some other work which I was doing at that time, which I haven't finished doing yet, where I was looking at how we can combine caning with grid shells and so how, so again, caning is normally there's a frame that's 2D and then, but, but if you start to combine that logic where you also use the grid shell logic of bending it to become three-dimensional, um, I think there's a lot of possibilities there where either you use a 2D frame or you start to use a 3D frame, but then still by bending it, you get the actual structural geometry. Um, I'm doing also, I'm, uh, Wissam al-Sali is a, is a good dear friend of mine as well. And... Uh, uh, we're, we haven't done too many collaborations yet, but we hope to do some in the future uh, that are a bit more robust than just co-teaching a course. And um, in particular, uh, in Jordan, they have this amazing uh, goat fiber uh, textile that's made by hand. So it's, you know, it's, it's a local material. And the beauty of it for their tensile structures is the first time it rains, it leaks. But after it leaks the first time, something happens to the fibers where they expand and it becomes completely waterproof. And I don't know, that's amazing. It's fascinating, totally blown away by this. And they're incredibly beautiful, the, the craft that they need to do with this. So I'm super interested in things like that, which can advance my monocular vision uh, from the US and kind of see possibilities that really can challenge just using fiberglass and resin as a, as a rigidifying technique. And, um, and I don't know, I think there's, I'm interested in it. I wouldn't say I have an answer for it, but there's definitely a lot of directions for that. I think also the concrete fa fashion tailoring with the, with, the, with the fabric formers, that kind of gets into that idea as well, where it doesn't, the, the fashion tailoring techniques probably don't make it more uh, engineering performative per se, maybe a little bit though, because when you tailor a pair of pants, uh, it probably makes better transition between columns and slabs, but it also provides some other kind of just delightful, you know, uh, evaluation criteria of just making in a space that has character, personality, scale that we normally don't have. So I think there's they're definitely very interested in that. And I know you have a lot of amazing culture of making in, in India as well. Yes, yes, yes. No, and also there are some very fundamental kind of uh, overlapping. There is there is an idea of economy, there is an idea of uh, repetition, there is a kind of a logic, but that logic uh, quite easily 
transforms and adapts to various situations so and specifically in our context that it could it could it could kind of help uh, completely revitalize uh, the certain crafts and certain material which are which are not not uh, not necessarily used much in, in or not associated with future of things they are associated with the past and that's a pity <laughs> Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, I, and I, again, I think uh, this mindset that we keep looking at high tech as the future yeah, yeah, yeah. is, I think, a flaw. It is a future. It is one of the futures. But we can't forget the past and we can't forget about some simple low-tech techniques. And, and again, I think um, if someone can make something that's low-tech that anyone can do, that really might change the way we build in the world. If someone invents something that's only doable with a very – expensive machine that you have to be highly skilled to use that's only going to have so much of an impact in the world as a whole and um and i think we also again have to be sensitive to different cultures of making and roots i think yeah, this reminds me of our discussion while the workshop was happening like about the craft so i think joseph if this is coming up again and again uh, let's let's collaborate sometime like some craft forms of india and when we have a student here a student let's 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 think about some something like that in future so i can identify a few things and send you across and then we can think about it yeah no i think there's and even if i remember you know even with the digital futures world workshop yeah. you know you were you were interested in is how you can look at mathematics as a way to kind of demystify some yeah. geometries of of local crafts or, right, or crafts. Right, right, right. And I think the, again, the more we can find a way to almost, yeah. uh, I wouldn't say transform a craft, but systematize it. Systematize, yeah, yeah. That's a better, better way. Yes. And I think that's, yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited about that possi mm -hmm. those possibilities. And I think that's where computation comes in, not just using the computer, but kind of really understanding the rules, constraints, parameters of this, and then what are the possibilities to exploit it into new directions. Yeah, I think there are one or two questions in the chat box. Can you just ask them? Yeah. If you have some questions, or just would you like to unmute and ask, or should we continue? Um, okay. So yeah. uh, my question was that through the presentation, we saw a lot of examples which were driven, uh, which which drove a form through certain parametric calculations, and uh, they were in the uh, we saw that physically. So could you also talk about how this? Uh, this process of uh, the, the parametric calculations leading to so how this process plays a vital role in designing a space into a place like going beyond the tangible uh, like uh, rather than keeping it only in its physical form how would it be helpful to um, get the experience of a specific space also through through these parametric calculations I'm not sure I fully understand. So you're saying the how do I get the you're, you're talking about the relationship between physically experiencing something versus uh, looking at it just uh, through computational modes. Is that what the question yes. is? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think um, I guess a good way of, of just talking about that is kind of even in the way in which I teach my students. You know, I think if I ask the student to build a model with sticks and dowels or I said build a model with paper folding, or I said build a model using Rhino or software, depending on which framework they're using to, to make is also a framework to think with. So they're all different instruments to think with. And so I think they're equally valuable. And, uh, and I think the same thing's true, you know, like if I'm, if I'm doing something with mathematics, I have a certain framework for how I've learned to think through that. That's very strange and unique. So I can actually, you know, I have a, you know, I always have a sketchbook. Thing. So you know, here's, here's my sketchbook, you know, and I, I, I often even sketch with math where I can write an equation and, but I can start to imagine it through these kind of fundamental transformations of, okay, if I do this, I'm going to pinch the shape. If I do this, I'm going to twist the shape. And so, you know, if someone said, to me, oh, how would you remake this tower? And I'd say, oh, I'll start with the cylinder and then maybe I'll pinch it. And then maybe I'll, I'll do a couple helixes to get the tile, you know, so I might have a way of thinking about it that way. Um, but then with the fiberglass, and especially with the curved crease folding, uh, when I was first doing the curved crease folding, I folded it and, and I was doing it. And at some point it went pop. And then I would do the next one and it went pop. 
And I was like, why is he making this popping sound? It's kind of, that's, I don't, I never get that little popping sound when I do the straight creases. And then I realized that all curved creases, especially when they're closed loops, uh, they actually are buckling. So they're what we call a bistable structure. So that means they can pop one way or the other way. But I didn't realize that until I first was, or it wasn't something I wanted to dive into more to understand until I was literally physically touching the material of the paper and making those models myself. And then, you know, I even had dialogues with uh, some really brilliant theoretical physicist who got really excited about that because suddenly the way in which I'm organizing crease patterns works for how we organize stretch fields for liquid crystals and things like that. But it's, but again, the, I wouldn't have dove into buckling and bistable structures and even, even more into curved creases if I didn't realize that, that it actually has a different structural possibility that you don't get with the straight ones. Um, and, uh, you know, at first I just thought they looked pretty or, you know, cool. And um, I want to learn how to make them because they seem hard to make. Uh, but physically making them, I get a different understanding. And then I guess your question about like the whole space, unfortunately I haven't had the opportunity to build a lot of things really big. Um, and I hope to have opportunities to do that in the future. And I, the way in which I hope to do that in the future is less through myself and more through collaborations with other practicing architects. And I, I like the idea of not being the one who just authors everything, but just contributes a small piece to the overall project where I can share my expertise and help a particular aspect of a project grow. So I do hope at some point I can experience it at that level and then really better answer your question about what's it like to phenomenologically kind of see a space when you have, I don't know, creases all around you. Hope that answers your question okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So we have one more question in the chat box. Uh, it says, could you explain about the fabric molding technique? Uh, how does it act as molds? Before we move ahead to the question uh, which we have presented, if you could answer this too. All right. So I think for this one, uh, the kind of shift I think educational system needs is I think a lot of, uh, and then I'll maybe, I'll, well, I guess for the, so for the fabric formwork one, I guess I can talk about that first. For that one, it's really just fabric. So it's just fabric that's pulled in tension. So there's a, there's a boundary on the bottom and the boundary on the top that are pulling that column taut. Um, so there's a frame to hold the fabric taut and that frame can be re, was reused for all of the uh, fabric formworks. So it's not Sorry. I'm sorry, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't hear that. I think there was too much static. But, um, but anyhow, for, so for that, that's what, uh, that's what that was uh, in order to do the fabric casting. Um, and then for the, this question about architectural education, I think, um, I think the academy, it's different in, in different places in the world, but in the US in particular, and that's what I can speak on, there is a strange dominance towards looking at architecture as an intellectual discourse that builds on itself, where a lot of times the academy or a school of architecture is in its own autonomous bubble, where we're looking out into the practice and to the world, but we're not actively engaging in that world. We're kind of creating our own inquiries and so, uh, you know, even as an academic, we have, we have scholarship, which is kind of building on other work of scholarship. Well, on the other side of the bubble, are, there's this rich dialogue between practitioners and communities, because the communities is, is oftentimes their client, and practitioners and industry, and industry is often who is the one building it. So if you want to do a masonry building, you have to work with the local brick manufacturer, as an example. And so there, I think there's, a, I think it's going to be quite powerful to start to break that silo where the academy reaches out to practice and says, how can we have a dialogue? How can we help advance practice? Where the academy reaches out to industry, how can we advance the way we think about building? How can we transform your industry? And the academy reaches out to client uh, communities and say, how can we help a community in need through a design studio? And just as an example, this semester I'm coordinating the second year undergraduate studio at Clemson, and uh, we are doing that. Um, so we're working with our local American Institute of Architects chapter in Columbia, South Carolina, 
Um, we're working with U.S. Brick and Martin Marietta, so a, brick, the lo a local brick manufacturer as well as a local stone quarry adjacent to our site. And we're working with the mayor of Casey in South Carolina uh, to help revitalize their downtown, which uh, had been abandoned for many years and then in recent years has shown signs of starting to be revitalized. And so by doing all this and having a dialogue between all these different parties, it might have an opportunity to make change in that place through the studio, but it also changes the way the students think about the relationship between their education and practice. And it's, I don't believe education is about preparing students for practice. It's about pre basically preparing students to shape the future of practice. And, uh, and I'm also becoming more interested in how we radicalize uh, normative architecture or create a new normative rather than just looking at something that's completely uh, more of the notion of like a star architect mentality um, where we're with the emphasis is more on novelty. And that's why for me, sometimes simple things like if we can really think of really make a column and a slab way more interesting, that can affect a lot of buildings in the world. And so I'm more interested in sometimes simple questions like that uh, rather than uh, just uh, necessarily making the, the coolest thing that's possible. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of that. And then maybe the last thing I would say is, I think we also have to embed research everywhere in the curriculum from freshman studio all the way through PhD because we can't build the way we've been building. We have to be more sustainable for the most part. And uh, I think research has to become intertwined in that throughout the process. Um, so yeah, that's some thoughts. Thank you so much, sir. I guess as a final year student, I can say that there is a growing awareness towards research uh, in the educational system today that we have in our university, and I hope for it to grow even more. Now we move ahead to the last question of uh, the session today. Could we move to the next question? Yeah, so what are your suggestions for the students? Like, How can one develop a research and computation-based outlook towards architecture. And in fact, I would also like to add not just that, but also a drive towards research and finding out solutions for your imaginations. Well, uh, my biggest suggestion to my students is always, if you don't know what to do, do something. I think that's still a great piece of advice. Um, and, uh, and I think the reason for that is that you really want to be able to design no matter what your constraints are, what you may think is a limitation, but really understand how that's the design opportunity. And, and, and don't be just waiting for an idea to come to you. Explore with whatever's in front of you. And, and, and the other thing is just be open to embrace uncertainty and the unexpected. If you're, if you're kind of expecting that something unexpected will come, you'll see it. If you're blinded because you already think you know what you want because you've seen it somewhere, then you're not really uh, embracing what's possible. And uh, so I think that's really important. And I think as far as developing research and computation, I think, uh, you know, for me, uh, computation is, uh, is just using rules, constraints, parameters. So it's kind of just rigor in many ways. And it's how you just systematize something or think about it more systematically. And you can be using something more advanced like mathematics, or it could be as simple as just kind of taking a ruler and a pencil and a piece of paper and drawing some straight lines that create a curve. You know, and, um, but I would say the thing about computation is, is sometimes, especially in, and I think this is again a, a critique of not everyone in the world, obviously, but there's a, there's a certain growing affinity with the digital where the digital is becoming, you know, a divorce from the material world. I think we can't forget materials. We can't just design everything through kind of abstract computation and then say, now we've got to build it. There has to be a relationship of back and forth dialogue. And we have to be aware of as we're changing our frameworks back and forth that it changed the way we see opportunities. And um, I don't have an answer for that, but I'm really interested in that kind of back and forth dialogue. And I think if you can learn to adapt in that back and forth way, you'll be ready for anything that comes at you. 
So that's some advice. Thank you so much, sir. That sounds great. So now we will uh, ask Shripat, sir, to, to present his opinions about the session we've had today, along with the thank you note for the speaker. Well, then opinions, I think this is the third time uh, since the Fab Binale. I've been listening to you, Joseph, along with that great workshop, those five, six days we spent working with you. Uh, and I, I totally agree with you that this is the era where uh, grounded uh, research and the way you have uh, presented today also, like uh, how you are touched based on all the aspects behind the design and not only one aspect, including culture, materiality, mathematics. And and I uh, always we keep on telling the students that anything you just randomly draw or model on the digital platform doesn't necessarily mean that that's your design, but all these grounded things are important. And I think they must have really understood the way uh, the way lecture went uh, and it got developed into and uh, got uh, diverse into various directions. So I really, really am happy that uh, within a short notice, you actually agreed to speak with our students and uh, looking forward for probably a workshop for our students in future or some collaborative thing of a week or something in future, definitely because the kind of direction which uh, your research is going. In fact, in fact, I, I like that Dumbnail book also. Like, uh, yes, it is. It is never done in a scientific manner. When 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 somebody has a, a picture and then only speaks in few words about the simplest thing somebody has done towards design or life, it's a very interesting uh, aspect because uh, most of the times architects write too much, speak too much, <laughs> is a kind of uh, phenomenon everywhere. But then I I would definitely order that book for our library because it seems to be like a like a kind of a small uh, guidebook towards people's opinions and very short opinions and and as you said that future never will be unidirectional it has to have so many directions and uh, yes I am getting personal messages as you have started your lecture and uh, there are quite a few faculty and some of our alumni also who have joined the lecture about the way it has developed uh, and the way it went. So thank you so much, jo Joseph, once again, and they yeah, definitely will be in touch. And uh, from uh, on behalf of Academy of Architecture, I really thank you for taking out time and really enlightening our students uh, at undergraduate level. Thanks a lot. Yeah, well, and, and thank you again for inviting me. And uh, you know, oh. Shripad, you know, we're we're friends, and it's great to see you like this, even though it's not in person. And uh, I would be delighted to give a workshop in the future and uh, have, up, have an open dialogue with your school students or faculty. And, uh, you know, I'm, I became a professor because I just like to share knowledge and sometimes create knowledge. And uh, so, yeah, I'm just, just generally happy to share some thoughts. Uh, but just note, you know, it's just some thoughts. It's just one, one person's ideas of many. And so... Uh, don't feel like you have to agree with all of them or adopt them. Um, just uh, see it as, you know, one perspective. Um, but, yeah. And I look forward to visiting Mumbai again. I really... Definitely, love... definitely. <laughs> so soon everything will come back to normal and we will be able to meet in person sometime, definitely. Uh, thanks a lot once again. Uh, yeah. and so early in the morning, actually, you agreed like 6 a.m. at your place. So that shows the, the kind of interest you have towards academics and in interacting with students. Yeah, my pleasure. And also wish a uh, happy birthday to your daughter. Yeah. <laughs> because I had yeah. message, message, but then now we are sure. So she's three, right? Yeah, so I have two yeah. daughters and one of them turned three and the other yeah. one's five. So that's the, that's the joy of my life. Yeah, of course we have to, but you know. But and I see the way you enjoy the life also. It's not only academic. I have been following you, and that's also a crux of your happiness. Maybe like the way you are also enjoying life. It's not just just academic. Yeah, I mean, I, I it's, uh, you know, we we even through design, and that was maybe one of the questions about the experience. You know, everything is design in the end. Exactly. So we're always learning. <laughs> throughout every every day you know even when i'm with my three-year-old daughter and i see the way she sees the world i'm learning through her lens of play you know, you know for her a little roll of tape is not a roll of tape it's it's like a frisbee or a wheel yes. or, or, you know, 
Wow. So there's so much. Yeah. That's all right. Uh, so Ikra, uh, can we can we call it a day for today's lecture? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you, sir. And thanks a lot to all the enthusiastic students from the academic council who has been interacting with him and setting up the meeting and everything. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.